Hello, everyone. My name is Dara. This is Dara Hallmark. And this is your safe space where you can come in and we can talk all things Hallmark Channel. Now, normally I'm by myself, but I am not by myself today, you guys. We have a special guest. Her movie just premiered on the Hallmark Channel, but you can also see it on Hallmark Movies Now. We have the executive producer and our leading lady of Legend of the Lost Locket, Miss Natasha Burnett. Natasha, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Hi. Nice to chat to you. Indeed. Okay, so our icebreaker question for this episode. We like to eat here at the home of Dear Hallmark. Okay, so I need to know, what was the last like amazing meal that just made you go, that just blew your mind? <laughs> okay, the other night I actually ordered a Thai coconut soup with rice noodles. And I have no idea why I've never ordered it before. But I decided that was just really amazing. <laughs> I love Thai. Like Thai is one of my favorite flavors and it's one of my favorite cuisines to eat. That sounds, yeah. my mouth is watering. It's so bad. Oh, <laughs> that's it. That sounds really, really good. That sounds really, really good. It was really good. <laughs> I'm trying to think the last really good. Oh, there's a, there's a spot right next to my building. They make a really, really good chicken quesadilla and they add um, like a garlic pepper oil to it as like a garnish with sea salt and peppers. And look at me, it's starting again. I gotta stop, it's so hard. <laughs> but yes, that I, I now I know what I'm gonna have for dinner tonight. So that's it, I'm grateful for, <laughs> for this question. But enough about me, let's talk about you and how you got into acting. Would little Natasha be surprised to find out where you ended up in terms of being on When Calls the Heart, acting, executive producing? Talk to us a little bit about how you got into acting. Well, I know little Natasha probably wouldn't be surprised that I ended up being an actor. Um, I was always doing something in the arts when mm. I was uh, I was always in every single school play and um, all of that kind of stuff. And then uh, I did some singing lessons, some classical singing lessons when I was about 13. And I actually didn't enjoy doing classical singing. And mm. so I stopped. It was only after a few months as well. Um, and then later on in school, when I was about 17, uh, a friend of mine actually was doing a younger generation theatre show. And mm. she had asked me if I wanted to join for the final couple years. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'll, I'll give that a go. And I went and I auditioned and um, I got a solo in my in my first year. Um, and that was, that was really exciting because it gave me a good insight into how certain parts of the industry work because it was theatre mm -hmm. and uh, you know and theatre is so big in the UK mm -hmm. so uh, it gave me good insight on being on stage and I, I I would think I had stage I wouldn't maybe stage fright is too too dramatic but maybe it was just like state performance anxiety mm -hmm. so it really helped with that because I didn't even realize it was such a big deal. And then um, when I left, when I left the theater show and I finished school, I actually went and trained as a cosmetologist and beauty therapist. Oh my goodness. <laughs> totally, totally different. What happened was my mother, she had said to me, okay, if you want to be in the arts, no problem. But um, like your sister, you have to, you know, pay for, for things of your own, you know, as well, mm -hmm. just to be able to learn how to budget, right? Mm -hmm. And so she said, well, I suggest that you do some sort of vocation that you can do, even if you are acting. And so I thought, okay, well, at first I tried hairdressing. I thought I loved hairdressing. And I, it just wasn't for me, it wasn't yeah. for me. Um, and then I switched to beauty and cosmetology. I did a course in that and I absolutely loved, I still love beauty. 
And I am so glad I actually did it because it's one of those professions where you can do in and out of it. You know, you can have private clients where you do their manicures or whatever. It can mm -hmm. be something that you do at any point. Um, and also doing the cosmetology, it means that one day, hopefully one day, um, you know, I could um, do something with, I don't know, Mac or Sephora or something, you know, because yeah. I actually learned how all of these things work so I'm really excited that I actually did it now um but once I finished that I was looking through a newspaper at auditions that they would sometimes put there's a newspaper we had called the stage um and I saw an audition for Diana Ross and um I just I just decided on the spot that why not just give it a go um, and in between all of this, I was kind of doing, I think, background work because mm -hmm. I wanted to know what it was like to be in TV and film as well. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of background work. Um, but then I went to this audition, um, having no idea how to even prepare for a theatre audition. Um, I go in my, in my glasses and no makeup on and totally looking completely frumpy. And... I see everybody else there who's clearly already done this role before. <laughs> they've got the wig, they've got the dress. Yeah. And yeah. I think, well, this is definitely not for me. <laughs> um, so I go in and I sing Baby Love and um, I leave. And even before I even got back to the train station, they called me and uh, said they wanted me to do the role. Um, so, so, so that was my big I suppose introduction into sort of theatre world yeah. um, and I and I played her for about five years it was on a UK wow. tour and and that that was really fun that was a really exciting experience because at the time you know Diana Diana Ross has always been big but then when mm. you go and you do these shows and the audience they they really love what you do and they loved the music and it was a complete Motown show. So they had The Temptations, The Four Tops, Marvin Gaye, they were all there. And, and just the, the reaction on people's faces when, when we finish and we'd go out and sign the brochures and uh, just to see how they react to, to what we're doing and how happy it sometimes makes them. And they tell stories about how you know, it was, they weren't having a good day and then they finally came and they watched the show and it made them feel really good. So mm -hmm. it was almost a realization as to what it means to be in this industry and how it actually really can be helpful to people and their mood and really entertain, I mean, it is entertainment, but like, you know, to yeah. entertain people and make them forget about what's going on for even if it's just an hour and it really makes yeah. a big difference to them. So that was... um that was a big part of where it all started. Um, the extras work, I did I did a lot of the, did some EastEnders of British soap, which is, you know, they had a hospital drama called Holby City, which is another one. So everybody wanted to be on those, those sets, right? Mm -hmm. um, and just learning about how long the days are and what's required of you. And then I think when I was an extra, I definitely felt like oh, just... I don't want to be in this position. Mm -hmm. I want to. I want to be in another position. But I really, mm -hmm. in the UK, I didn't really know how. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you did like anywhere you needed an agent, but I didn't really know how to get one. It's always kind of a rocky start in this industry for a lot of people because they don't really know who to talk to or where to mm -hmm. go or anything like that. So. Um, uh, that really was my, my the two avenues I went down. And uh, at a certain point, as much as I love Diana Ross, <laughs> I didn't know if I wanted to continue either in the industry or continue playing Diana Ross because it had been for so long. I wasn't sure whether I was bored of playing the same character all mm. the time, every day, mm -hmm. or it was just that maybe I'd grown out of the industry. Mm. So um, I had moved to Australia for a year 
and yeah this is all this all goes like all over the place i'm gonna just <laughs> sit back you go ahead yeah this is great <laughs> this is great oh my goodness that's so cool yeah i i met someone and um he was from australia and so i ended up going to australia for a year with him and deciding you know what i'm gonna do anything i want because i really mm. don't know how i feel Mm -hmm. Of course, I end up back in the industry doing <laughs> uh, a dinner cabaret show, which was so fun. It was, they had magic and these aerialists and then, yeah. and then I was singing um, When Doves Cry. It was just, oh, it was just, it was just great. And, and I, I loved it. And um, what else? Etta James, At Last. They were my two songs while the aerialists did their little bit and it was uh, it was you know anything in the industry it's really nice actually when you aren't just on one journey in the industry and mm -hmm. go into different areas because you learn so much about yourself and what you mm. want out of the industry um it was really it was really a learning curve for me because unfortunately in Australia they didn't have a lot of work for black actors mm -hmm. And um, The Lion King was coming to Australia, but it was in sort of two years. So I was like, well, I can't really sit and wait for that. Right, right. <laughs> so I ended up just deciding to um, just stay in Australia for a little bit longer. And I spoke, ended up speaking to the choreographer in the show, had um, a friend that was a talent scout. So, oh, just connections they're all yeah. over the place. <laughs> um, and I spoke to him because he dealt with actors that wanted to go to LA or Canada. Mm. And he was explaining to me the differences between the two places and that, you know, well, Vancouver is actually a pretty good place because you can, the work visa allows you to do any job. Mm. Um, Whereas in LA, it's the one type of visa and you have to remain in the industry. And so he said, well, you could do Vancouver. And then if you decide, perhaps you want to move down to LA and it's just smaller steps so you can make up your mind. Um, so I was like, right, well, guess I'm going to Vancouver then. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and then I arrived here just I was totally a fish out of water. I didn't, yeah. you know, honestly, if I had to do it now, I don't think I would do it now, to be honest. I don't know that I would. I don't know what I was thinking at the time. I was just like, right, well, I guess I'm going to Vancouver now. Didn't know anyone here. Didn't know where I was going to stay. Um, wow. And I and I tried to get meetings with agents in Toronto and agents in Vancouver and hear me pretending like I'm making money now or something. I'm like flying from one side of the country to the other, staying in hotels. Like I have this meeting today and I have this meeting tomorrow. Like really? No. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, I, I did end up with my agent in Vancouver and I ended up staying and just trying to make it work. But I did have a very lucky start here because three weeks after I arrived, I booked my first job, which was just, it was so random. That's <laughs> so like the connection of it all, like the dominoes oh, are just yes, falling into yes. place as you tell this. <laughs> so when is the book coming out? I just need to know, cause I'm like, you know? This is this I is. I should wild. be writing this down. Really, Chronicle Chronicles of Natasha is what. It is. This is great. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was. It's. It's been a journey. I almost very rarely think about it. Mm -hmm. I don't think about it. But when I tell the story, mm -hmm. it's kind of crazy that I even <laughs> did that and <laughs> yeah. decided. Well, I guess I'll just. All I had when I came to Canada was enough of enough money to get a return ticket. Oh, wow. And mum was saying, you know, you know, do you want, I can send you money. I'm like, no, no, I've got it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this well myself. Wow. 
That's so brave and courageous and takes gut. <laughs> and that's again, like you're a gambling woman when it comes like that. Was, that was. So if I am gamble. now, I certainly was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just. That takes so much heart, though. And what what do you think keeps you motivated to keep doing it? Like, what is it you love about acting so much that keeps you in it? Do you know, there are actually a few things. There are a few things. I remember um, when I was doing the show that I did um, in the UK, the amount of birthdays, anniversaries, just important dates that I missed because I was on tour and it mm. almost became a thing where I felt like this needs I have to make this work mm. because I have missed so many things that I'm not going to do all of this and to have it all fall apart mm. mm -hmm. so that was definitely one re that was a big one for me in the beginning um and then of course you know coming to Vancouver and being here by myself with all my family in the UK it you know it made me feel like okay I'm I've I'm got to try and get this together I've got to try and make something work and you know I had milestones in my head sort of like first of all can I get an agent to take a meeting okay good mm -hmm. right now can I get someone to sign me okay good okay now can I get a job okay great now can I get a bigger role okay you know and there were these milestones that I was trying to kind of hit um along the way um and there was <laughs> definitely a point where somewhere in between leaving Australia and coming to Canada I realized that I couldn't, I didn't, wasn't able to do anything else either. Mm. Even though I could do beauty, it mm -hmm. was, I can do it if I had private clients, for example, but mm -hmm. to go into a salon just randomly and be like, Hey, will you hire me? I'd been out of the industry for too long. Mm. Um, you know, new treatments came in and all that kind of stuff. And I sort of thought, wow, this is all I know how to do. Mm. so I better just do it <laughs> <laughs> you know, <it's> just <laughs> um and then of course you know of course I love I love doing what I do mm. I always am flip-flopping between whether I want to be on tv and film or whether I want to do theater or if I want to do musicals because I love all of it I love mm. all of it and I don't think there's been uh I'm, at no point have I ever really, truly felt like, oh, I just can't, I can't do this. I can't do mm. this. I mean, it's definitely been hard. It's definitely been hard because when you go from theater to TV, it's a very different journey. Theater yeah. is extremely consistent, you know, you know, just five years, roll over, roll over, roll over. Whereas TV is stop, start, stop, start. You don't book for a year. Then you book everything in six months. And then you don't mm. book for another year, you know. Mm. Um, so that was definitely something I had to get used to. Um, but I I couldn't imagine doing anything else. I really couldn't. <laughs> yeah. So how did your love of acting and the arts find its way into executive producing? Because... Us in Hallmark Land, we we know you from When Calls the Heart, but now you and Viv Leacock, you guys are producers on Hallmark's latest movie in the Spring Into Love lineup, Legend of the Lost Locket. So how did producing come into the gumbo that is Natasha's journey into the into the art world? Yeah. You know, I have to say I was extremely lucky, very, very lucky. I'd been asked many years before you know well not that many years before but <laughs> before <laughs> if I would want to do anything else on the other side of the camera mm. and at one point I said oh you know I think I'd want to do directing although I'd never actually done it <laughs> um and then when when we had started doing when calls the heart I can't tell you it was ever a thought of mine. I honestly felt like an opportunity like that would be so far away from where I was. Mm. I wouldn't have even known how to get to it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, when we realized 
how popular the Canfields were on the show, we thought that it would be a good idea to maybe try and see if we can push a concept that allows us to do something of our own. Mm -hmm. Because we were hoping, and which we're very grateful for because they did, that the hearties would roll over onto whatever it is that we decided to do. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, To be honest, when the idea initially came up, we, we both came up with this concept. Um, I wanted to remain British and he wanted to do roles that he really enjoyed playing mm -hmm. the detectives. Mm -hmm. um, and I think at the time that it came up, it wasn't even a thought as to what our role technically was in mm. the movie other than playing the two leads. Um, and then I suppose as the idea grew, we took it to one of the, the writer of Hayley Deans, which is uh, Michelle Rishi and, and who yeah. knows her well. Um, and then we took it to another producer who also worked on that as well, Howard Bornstein. And um, they were all totally game for the concept. And it's almost, it came up as we were going through the process mm. and just getting involved in how the story was going to be told and what story we were going to end up telling. And um, of course, then we then we took it to Aisha Francis at Hallmark um, to to see what her thoughts were, and she was totally on board with it. So I have to say, it wasn't sort of a decision like right now we're gonna uh, be producers on this and we're gonna do no. Okay. It just sort of came. It came okay. with the territory, sort yeah. of thing, really. Yeah. And it's so funny because the premise of the movie, I had just finished reading a book called Provenance and it's a fiction oh. book and it's a, but she's an interior designer and she was researching the provenance of um, a specific home. I think it was, and she specialized in a certain, like the arts and crafts movement, even though she right. still had a wealth of knowledge. Um, when it came to antiques within the interior design industry. So going from reading that book to watching this movie, it gave me all the feels. Like the movie is just so cute. And then the people who um, starred alongside of you guys, like Zach Santiago, Samantha Cole, and the um, the little sugar cookie who um, who played Samantha Cole's oh, daughter. I can't think Isabel. of her name. It's, oh my gosh. She was in another oh. Christmas movie. I'm inventing the Christmas Prince with Tamara Mori Housley. It, I felt like, look at her growing up because she was so small in that <laughs> movie and now she's in this movie. I, It was so beautiful watching you guys just play alongside each other. Like, what was the energy like on set as you guys were filming? Oh, it was such, it was such a comfortable energy. It was such a comfortable energy, such a fun energy. But I suppose the comfort came from the fact that because Viv and I had been in the pre-production meetings, we mm -hmm. were there the whole time. And so with Kevin Fair, the director, and um, Ali, who was the production designer, and, you know, there was, we were there with everyone. So by the time we got to set, everybody knew what was going on and mm. everybody was kind of, I mean, you are trying to get things done, but you're kind of more sure. relaxed and yeah. everybody's more comfortable. So working with the rest of the cast, I think they came on and they they could feel the relaxed, the more relaxed way that we were because everybody was just, I mean, we were pretty chill. We did have a lot of fun. We did mm -hmm. definitely have a lot of fun in between takes and things like that because, because we could, because everybody was on the same page. It makes such a big difference when that happens. Yeah. And you, your character got into some hijinks. I was very <laughs> surprised because normally our leading lady, you know, she's about her business if she's a corporate girly or, you know, she's in the flower shop just feeling <laughs> about, but you're crawling into windows, going into archives, going all around the world in 80 days. And I'm just like, this is really, 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 really <laughs> cool. And I like what was your thought process in terms of having your character kind of get into the weeds of really finding the provenance of this piece of jewelry that she was looking for? Yeah, I I really liked that Amelia had her own journey to go on. That's that was my favorite thing about her. 
that her mm. journey wasn't because some guy left her or her fiance she's not sure about or anything you know it was just mm -hmm. focused on Amelia and her journey to find the other half of this locket and I and I do think it's nice that her motivation was completing something that her mother had started mm -hmm. I think I, I I love that that's the case and actually um in the movie when I go up to the B the room in the B&B &B, Mm -hmm. And I take a photo out and I lean it up. That's actually a photo of my grandmother that oh we decided to use. Yeah. That is so beautiful. <laughs> that is so beautiful. Oh, wow. I really appreciated how determined Amelia was. It was yeah. like nothing. She had it. She had that one thing in her scope, <laughs> in her line yeah. of sight. And yeah. nothing was going to deter her. That's incredibly inspiring. Yeah, I, I loved that she definitely, she was tenacious and mm -hmm. ambitious and she just went for what she wanted. I mean, not necessarily always in the right way, but... <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Sorry. indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> but I also loved how intelligent she was. Like, she mm -hmm. knew in terms of the um antiques that she I've always admired that how you can just look at something can, you can tell if it's a forgery or not you can tell from what period what era who was reigning at that time like I think that that's such an admirable skill how did it feel even though I know you were you know we're playing make-believe here but like do yeah. you as Natasha do you have any are there any embers of desire when it comes to antiques and history? Like, is that something that you're genuinely interested in? Well, I do. I do like history. I think it's it's made me more interested in antiques. And mm -hmm. um, so I did end up watching a lot of the Antiques Roadshow. Because <laughs> there were so many questions I had about certain things, like how to handle jewellery, how to mm. handle old books. Because there was a scene in there where I was handling a book. And uh, mm -hmm. that ended up having to be cut out. But just knowing the correct way to handle artifacts and depending on how old they are and things like that. And I I made sure I learned how to use a jewelry loop correctly when I was looking mm. at the sugar sifter. Yes. Um, yeah, and being able to put the hallmark that was written on the bottom into focus and all of that kind of stuff. Because I just really wanted it to I wanted it to be real yeah and yeah. I'm I'm actually really glad I did because there was uh, a moment when I go into the uh, diner when I'm surprised that everybody's there with their antiques yeah and I turn around and there's a jug or a pitcher I think you guys call it and I and I say oh is that a real James Umeekan and I asked them to tell me the name of it um, cause it was on the bottom. So I went and looked it up and it was a company that did actually, uh, it's a real company that it was in the early 1900s in Staffordshire in England. So I was like, Amelia would know this. She would know that. <laughs> so, um, I'm really glad that I put it in there and I said it the right way because someone messaged on Facebook and said, oh, I'm so glad they said Jane G. Meekin because my ancestors owned the company so I was really happy about that that's so cool it's so cool oh my goodness so talk about what was your favorite scene to shoot because there's so many cool moments there's the mm -hmm. ball there's you guys <laughs> trying to um somebody's following y'all into the attic and so you're yeah. trying to figure out who Who's been following you this whole time? You had goosebumps on the back of your neck because somebody <laughs> been following you. So tell us, what was your favorite scene to shoot throughout the movie? Um, actually, one of my favorite scenes was the scene in the diner. Actually, mm. doing appraising real artifacts. It, it was that was definitely fun. Um, and obviously, you know the way movies are edited. It was it was longer initially when we shot it so it was a lot of fun yeah. for me to do um the attic scene definitely I loved doing that attic scene yes. it was so fun every time we had to run up the stairs and and <laughs> like hide behind the pillar and it's kind of fun because you know I'm in 
formal ball attire and right yeah, it's so fun again hijinks like Amelia is just here for the hijinks and I love yeah. it now can you talk about the incorporation of the mystery element into this movie because it doesn't go full on kind of like Hallmark mystery. We don't have a dead body, you know? So we're yeah. not like hardcore <laughs> Hallmark mystery, but there is a, a, I think a beautiful mysterious element because we are looking for this locket. And then on also trying to find out who stole the art. And it's, it's just so many things that, that add this mysterious element to the movie. Can you talk about um, you and Viv, how you guys came to adding that mystery element into the movie? Well, initially, we wanted it to be a mystery. Oh. Um, but we knew that how it would be aired would mean it needs to be more of a rom-com. So mm -hmm. it was trying to incorporate the two and finding a way that that could successfully work. And we knew that going down this road was something different for Hallmark, especially when it's a rom-com mystery hybrid. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I always say that I'm really glad that we did because although it is not the traditional trajectory of a Hallmark movie, I just love that it just is something different mm -hmm. that they've that they've not done when it comes to a rom-com. And of course, yeah. you know, the, the, the rom-com element comes much later in the movie because Amelia is starting to get to know the town and doing mm -hmm. her job, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, it was trying to balance all of those things. Uh, and Michelle did a really good job of, you know, being able to balance Amelia's journey with the mystery mm -hmm. and the rom-com element. Um, and of course, it's always something that you don't know how it's gonna be received by the wider audience yeah but I definitely have said that you know it's either something that we've noticed that people absolutely love or it's just not for them and I actually like that I prefer that there's no middle of the road what was that movie again don't really remember mm, the name no okay. I love that it's you know it's gonna yeah. be a 10 out of 10 for you or perhaps the mystery element wasn't something that was for you and that's absolutely fine. But I just yeah. think it's nice to take your own path with something regardless of the reaction. Cause you know, you're going to get a strong reaction and that's nice. Yes. Yes. I, this movie is so cute. I say it's like that, that slow, if you're having a slow Saturday morning, you can just put this on, have breakfast in bed and just like get your Hallmark yeah. feels because of how cute. <laughs> how cute the movie is <laughs> now can you um talk about the town of Wilmington because I I wanted more from this town like I I want a sequel I want a book I want a <laughs> mini series like I want I want to live there I want to live there so can you talk about how you guys came up like with the because I've really I felt the small town feels it was it was definitely prevalent so can you talk a little bit about how you guys came up with kind of the vibe of the town and the town itself yeah, no, we we felt like, I mean, Michelle kind of came up with this town square concept and that's really quaint, you know, mm -hmm. and especially, and I think it was really showing the contrast between um, me coming from London mm -hmm. and coming mm -hmm. to such a small, quaint town. And I feel like that also played into the fact that... Um, James Jacobs or Jacob Jameson, whichever way you <laughs> want to name him, mm -hmm. uh, it plays into the fact that he created this town. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want it to look like a metropolitan, like you're in the middle of New York, right? You right. want it to look like a town that was built from scratch by this carpenter. And so that's what we were trying our best to, to get the feel of. Um, we weren't able to actually get a town square, but we were able to, you know, do the shots in a way that it could make it look like it was a cute little town square. And um, I think it was just important to to bring every everybody closer because especially sometimes in these movies, um, 
you 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 want to make sure that you know the space isn't too big or the actors aren't too sparse so it, mm. so it's not matching up right we wanted yeah. to really make sure that the space we had and the actors and the extras that we had could really make this town look like a real small town yeah and there's something charming about small towns in New England. I mean, I'm biased. I'm on the East Coast of the United States. So I'm always going to root for New England, Mid-Atlantic, however, but how have you? Um, but I think there is just something like quintessentially charming that the New England small towns have that I think you captured in that movie. And then also having the big city be Boston because that's a, a, a city we don't see a lot um, in our Hallmark movies. It's only like New York, LA, San Fran, San Diego, something else like that. But having Boston coming up uh, more, I, I appreciate that. So that I appreciate <laughs> that was really, really cool. That was really, really cool. Well, I want to ask you before I let you go, um, I actually have two questions before I let you go. So the first one is, do you see yourself doing anything more behind the camera? Like, do you see yourself writing or eventually directing? Like, wh where do you see, this sounds like a job interview question, but like, where do you see yourself <laughs> like further down? I don't want to say 10 years from now because it really sounds like a job interview. But like, where do you see yourself in the future as it pertains to the arts industry? You know, I... I don't know if I would write. I mean, I like coming up with ideas. Mm -hmm. I like coming up with ideas and working with people to develop ideas. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'd write. I mean, I definitely would produce again because that definitely was not on my radar at any point. Yeah. And I think it's because there's so many different types of producers on any one production and they all do different things. Yeah. So if you're not sure what type of producing you want to do, it wouldn't really make sense. You just see this list of all these types of producers. <laughs> and you're like, oh. right. um, but I did really enjoy being an exec on this one. Um, I uh, and maybe maybe I'm spoiled now. Maybe anything else I do, I'm just gonna want to be like, I'm coming to the meeting. I'm coming to the meeting. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't invited <laughs> yeah I love that I love that well Natasha thank you so much for coming into the home of dear Hallmark and just talking with us about Legend of the Lost Locket but before I let you go I want to give you the space to just say whatever it is you want to say you can talk about antiques you can talk about food chocolate milk I don't it's it's your moment to have um with the listeners and the viewers who are watching so I'll let you have the the last word to you. Thank you. Well, I just want to actually say a massive thank you that every to everyone that has commented and supported the movie. It means so much to us that you really did embrace our concept. And um, we really hope that we can give you what you want, which is a sequel. We would absolutely love to be able to do that. Um, and you know what? Until then, we'll just carry on watching the Canfields. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's so perfect. Thank you so much, <laughs> Natasha. Again, it was a pleasure having you here. You. And everyone, if you haven't already, it behooves you to go to Hallmark Movies now and watch Legend of the Lost Locket or find out when it's airing again on the Hallmark Movie Checklist app so you can catch it live and you can have the adrenaline of running to the bathroom during commercials and getting all your snacks during commercials and hurrying up to find out what happens next. I promise you, it is a rush, like especially with this movie <laughs> and all the mysterious elements that are incorporated in this movie. Well, everyone, she's Natasha. I'm Dara and this is Dear Hallmark and I will talk to you guys in the next video. Ciao my friends. Bye.